Well, we made it. We're back in James. It has been a little bit, but I'm excited to be back because, oh, there's so much great stuff around every turn in this book. So if you don't remember, uh, we did start this study in the book of James back at the beginning of June to spend most of our summer in, but we've taken a little break for community service and to talk about baptism and hear from our kids who went on their mission trip this summer. But one of the things that I love about this book and why I'm excited we're going through it is James wrote this book to the church, not to one specific church, but to the big C church, the churches at that time who were just growing and coming up and learning what it means to follow Jesus. And we call this series Gospel on the Ground because this book is so practical. It's really this gospel for how do I take another step today? Like where am I going as I'm on the ground and interacting with things that come before me what does the gospel have to say and how does it speak into these moments? That's why it's been fun and challenging to go through this because James really is taking this opportunity to speak hard truth in love and to show us how to do that, but also for our benefit to receive it and to hear it and to be challenged so that we can grow spiritually and increase in our affection for God. So that is what James is trying to do for us. So Keep that in mind as we read his words this morning, as we listen to what he has to say, because it's not always easy to hear. Well, today in James, we're going to be in chapter 3. You can follow along in the insert in the bulletin. The words will be there. Um, They'll be on the screen most of the time. Or open up your Bibles and follow along with us. But today we're talking about words, the power of words. Words communicate so much. They communicate meaning and purpose and emotion and desire. Many of us here today are here because of words spoken to us, right? Maybe someone invited you to come and be here today or because the gospel was spoken into your life and you're able to receive Christ. And for that reason, you're here today. You're gathered as the church to come before God's word and to learn from what it has to say. Words also create relationship, right? It's something as simple as, hey, you want to grab coffee? You want to go for a round of golf? You want to get dinner sometime? Will you marry me? Right? There's, there's all kinds of words that create relationship and change our lives in that way. Words improve and renew things. Right? Maybe you think, all right, what if, what if we just took this thing and we painted it blue? That, then what could it be like? Or, or what if we rebuilt it? I did one of those projects this weekend where we took something from what it was and took it apart and rebuilt it and made it new. Or or what if we just added bacon to it, right? I mean, you can renew anything with just a sprinkle of bacon. But words don't just improve things and create things. Sometimes words cause problems. When uh, we were younger, maybe, I don't know, I might have been eight. My brother was six. And we were living in Wichita, Kansas at the time. and, And our parents came home one day and just said, hey, what would you guys think if we lived in Kansas City? And my dad had an opportunity to take a job there, and we had a conversation, and it was just a conversation, right? Just feeling it out, seeing what was right for the family. And the next day at church, my brother informed everyone that we were moving to Kansas City. (laughs) That had some consequences for my parents. (laughs) They had to explain themselves, right? This was a secret. This wasn't something that everyone knew. We did not end up moving to Kansas City, although that would have been wonderful, but I love you guys too. Um... So sometimes words do create problems for us, right? They get us into trouble or they even can cause harm to others, right? Some of the biggest regrets that I have in my life are things that I've said that hurt someone else. James understands the power of words and his aim today is to help us to learn how to use our words to love God, to love others well, instead of just loving ourselves or hurting others. So that's what we're going to look at today. How do we speak fruitfully? How do we tame the tongue? So I want you to just listen. I'm going to read through our whole section here in chapter 3. Take in these words, listen, get the full picture. Then we're going to walk back through and make a few observations that won't be on the screen, but you can follow along in your Bible if you would like. James chapter 3, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. 
Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done. All right, we'll pause there. We're just going to go through verse 12 this morning. Let's pray. God, I, I praise you this morning for you are good and loving and knowing and fully capable of teaching us, instructing us, helping us grow. God, I pray this morning as we come to your word, you would speak to us. You would help us to listen. Help us to know you better and to increase our love for you. In your name, amen. All right, let's go to the the very first passage, the very first verse this morning. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, I remember back uh, to when I was in school and I had a variety of teachers. You've had this experience too. Almost all of us have had teachers that have come into our life. And I had a PE teacher that was so creative and would make these obstacle courses for us and really challenged our capacity to think outside the box and a problem solve. And I really appreciated that about him. And I, and I had an English teacher later on in school that taught me how to write. I was terrible. When I started that class, I failed my first paper, and little by little by the end of the class, I was able to get a good grade on a paper because this teacher cared about me, invested in me, taught me how to write. And when I was an LDI in Minneapolis, I had a teacher there who really taught me to love the Word of God and view it as the ultimate authority and have greater affection for God and His words. But we've also had bad teachers in life, right? I, I had a teacher in high school that was supposed to teach us French. I didn't learn anything. Je ne sais pas. If you teach, if you mentor, if you coach you have more influence than you may realize. You will have an impact on people. The question is, what type of impact are you going to have? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? Is it going to be helpful or hurtful or encouraging or discouraging? And sometimes in those unique moments, we even have the opportunity to change lives and inspire people through our teaching. But on the other side of the coin, it, it breaks my heart when I hear the stories of people that abuse their opportunity to be teachers, right? We always have people who do that. We have, we have cult leaders and pastors and politicians who are seeking power over other people instead of caring for their well-being, instead of trying to help them. James wants us to see so clearly in this passage all the way through that our words powerfully impact, powerfully impact. They are much more significant. They have much more strength than we could ever imagine, Right? The words of a teacher, coach, or mentor have a greater impact because a lot of times these are people that we trust. We have given them our trust, and so we take their words at face value. When we speak to people who trust us, their defenses are down, which is not a bad thing. It's because of the relationship that's been built, but it comes with extra responsibility. Now, when I read this passage from James, it actually almost sounds like he's saying, Maybe don't be a teacher, right? Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Maybe, maybe don't be a teacher, right? But I don't think he's trying to discourage teaching. I really don't. As much as I think he's trying to remind us 
of the power that exists in our words and the opportunity and the responsibility that is present when we teach others, when we influence others with our language. He wants us to have more reverence for the opportunity we have to teach and the words that come out of our mouths. But unfortunately, many people instead use teaching as a way to gain things for themselves, whether it's prestige or influence or respect. Many people today want to be teachers, but we don't always call them teachers in today's culture. It's interesting. We call them influencers, right? We have these social media influencers that get on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, wherever it is, right? And they have videos and followers, podcasts, and they're trying to influence people. This is powerful. And sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's hurtful. But James warns us against using our words in a way that will not be helpful to others. He says, you will be held accountable, right? You who teach will be judged more strictly. He wants us to have reverence for teaching and for the words that come out of our mouths because they're powerful. And when they're simply used for our gain and not being used for their intended purpose, they will inevitably end up hurting others. But he goes on. In verse 2, he says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey, we can turn the whole animal or take ships, as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. This is strong language. What is James talking about here in verse 2? Right? Verse 2 is very interesting. What, what does it mean? What is he trying to say to us? I, I think it's this. He's saying we all stumble and we sin in many ways. This happens. But if, hypothetically, a person was somehow to have their tongue in check, right, to speak kindly to others, honoring God, then it must also be true that their whole body is in check because our words are the most difficult aspect of our lives to sanctify, to be made holy, to be pure. It's difficult. It's hard. And it's hard because really our words reveal what's going on in our hearts inside of us. They reveal which direction the ship is sailing, right? Ships with a small rudder steering the whole thing. He gives us this imagery. I love the ships that travel the Great Lakes, I absolutely love it. I can't get enough. Every time we're in Duluth, I want to see them come in and under the bridge. If we see them far out, I'll tell Caitlin, well, just, just, just hang out. Maybe get some ice cream. That ship will be here before you know it. And one of the biggest ships, or the biggest ship right now, is the Tregurtha, Big Paul as it's known. It's over 1,000 feet long, but its rudder is only about 20 feet. And that, now, I know that might sound big, but really, compared to this 1,000-foot-long ship, it's nothing. It's so small, but it has so much power to steer it wherever it needs to go. James is reminding us of the power that our mouths, that our words, that our tongues have when we speak. They lead us and guide us. They reflect the condition of our hearts. And because of this, I think James also wants us to see this, that our words are central to our spiritual growth. Our words are central to our spiritual growth. In verse 2, James is suggesting that if our words and speech were without fault, then we must be perfect, right? And by perfection, what he means is spiritually mature. And we know this because we learned it back in the first week of James. You may not remember, but he says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When he says perfection, he means that we've grown in Christ, we've become mature and more complete. And our words function for us as this barometer for revealing what is really going on in our hearts. What is the condition of our heart? How are we doing? Our words are a reflection of that. And they can also help us grow. So the question I have for you this morning, as we're faced with these challenging words from James, is do your words reveal the fruit of the Spirit coming from your heart, right? Do your words express kindness and peace and love and joy and patience and self-control? Or do your words reveal selfishness and sin in your life? Because our words will always reveal something about what's going on in our hearts. This is why James says teaching is a big responsibility because every one of us will certainly make mistakes with our words. We are not yet perfect. We are not yet spiritually mature. 
right? Sin related to the way we talk is such a big part of the human experience, a part of our lives, our faith journey. We have gossip and slander and lies and innuendo and hateful speech and harmful words and then hastily chosen words. These sometimes cause the most damage. We don't always think through what we want to say. We just blurt it out. It just comes out so fast. We've all said things we regret, things we wish we could have back. Now, our words may seem small, but they're very powerful. They steer us. They impact others. They reveal what's going on inside. And now, today's lesson is not going to be all negative, but we're going to dig in a little bit deeper here. James wants us to absolutely understand that there can be harmful things or catastrophic damage even that is a possible outcome of our words. Remember, James is speaking truth and love to us. He wants to help us grow when he says the following. He goes on and he says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Whoa. That is some strong language. What do we make of this? Well, first of all, not all sparks bring down forests, but some do. This doesn't mean we should fear sparks or never create them, right? Because they also have a positive contribution to make to the world. Fire's pretty great. But we should respect, you know, fire being a metaphor for our words. We should respect our words. We should understand their power, their ability to cause harm if used in the wrong fashion. Verse 6 here uses some very strong language about the tongue, right? It talks about it being fire and the source of evil. Our words can sometimes come against God. They can be anti-God. They can produce sin in our lives in a really significant way that's harmful to us. And he says they can corrupt the whole body. Our tongues don't just impact our words, but also it's, it's connected to our thoughts, right? Our longings, our imagination, these words that go through our mind and our plans, We typically think things through before we say them out loud, before we speak them, right? Example, sometimes maybe you'll be driving to a meeting, you're about to meet someone for lunch, for breakfast, for whatever it is, right? And you're running just a little behind and that thing goes through your mind, what am I going to give for a reason for being late today, right? And there's all kinds of possibilities. You could say, well, I just didn't manage my time well. Or you could say, I had a flat tire. Or you could say... I had an emergency or whatever it is, right? My mom called. I couldn't say no to my mom, right? Whatever it is that's going through your mind, and some of those things are true and some of them aren't, but they race through our head and we have to choose which of these things are we going to share for the reason that we're late today. Are we just going to be honest and say sorry? Are we going to give some excuse that is believable? The words go through our mind and our thoughts, our longings, our imaginations, our plans. They speak to us. And sometimes they can corrupt us from the inside out. And he says it sets our lives on fire and and, and they become corrupted by hell. This is some strong language. What does he mean? Well, let me share a a story with you that I think will help us to understand this. Right? Because it's a confusing description. Right? And and is itself set on fire by hell is, is some strong language. But what we see in Matthew 16 is this interaction between Peter and Jesus that helps us to unpack this and understand. In this story, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. We all know this story. We're familiar with it. But for Peter, for the disciples, this was hard to hear. They didn't want to hear this. So Peter kind of takes them aside, right? He's like, Jesus, right? And he began to rebuke him. He says, never, Lord. Like, this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen to you. This can't possibly happen. You're wrong, Jesus. Let me just, just come here. You're wrong. Oh, how does that normally go? Hey, Jesus, come here. You're wrong. Jesus turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Whoa, that's what happens when we tell Jesus, Jesus, you might be wrong. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
Now, in Peter's defense, I think he had good intentions. He cared for Jesus. He pulled him to the side. He was trying to correct him, right? They're, they're doing life together. But what Peter was concerned about was things of this world, his own safety and the, the safety of Jesus, but he wasn't concerned about the things that God was concerned about. He wasn't sharing the will of God in this moment. He didn't have his eyes fixed on God. Peter's words reveal the lack of faith and trust and understanding of God's will. And Jesus was there to bluntly let him know. Our words sometimes have a considerable negative impact. But Jesus graciously comes, graciously comes along to guide us back. Even to the point of seeming like they're coming from hell. They're coming from a place that isn't from God. Right? Get behind me, Satan. But Jesus cares for us. He walks alongside of us. James continues to help us understand this. In verse 7, he says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Now, I am in awe that people have found a way to tame animals like lions and bears and orcas, right? Things that are just unbelievably fierce and strong. And I, I just can't imagine like coming face to face with a bear in the woods. No, thank you. Uh, but somehow there are people who've come along and tamed these animals, right? These are powerful and intelligent animals that seem too wild to be tamed. But some people have found a way. And James is saying, he's suggesting that the tongue is even more wild than any of these things and cannot be tamed. That is a big statement. That is the significance of what we're dealing with when it comes to our words and the things that come out of our mouth. It is that difficult to tame our tongue. It should be respected and understood as such. Oh, hearing these words reminds me that I don't give enough respect to my words, to my mouth, and the power that can come. But mostly, I don't give enough respect to the power of sin to reign in our lives as long as we're humans in this broken world, to get to every aspect of our lives, including our words, right? Everything is broken. We talked about this in our series on sexuality, including the words that come from our mouths. They cannot be fully controlled or fully tamed. James wants us to see this so clearly. Even our words are broken. We should respect them. They are powerful. Now, there's a lot of reasons why, but I've been always very captivated by the story of Isaiah in chapter 6, where he has this moment of having this vision of being in the presence of God. But for the purpose of today, I just want us to see his reaction to God. I think it helps us to understand the power of words. We get to Isaiah 6, and, and Isaiah is having this vision. He sees God. He sees the angels flying around. He's in the presence of God, the th the. Uh, the trail of his robe is rolled out in the throne. It's the most majestic scene that any human has ever seen. And he sees all of this as he's processing this. And as he sees it, he interacts. The thing that comes to his mind is this. He says, woe to me. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live, live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The first thing that comes to him when he's in the presence of God and he sees his holiness is, there is something wrong with my mouth, with the words that come out of it. They are unclean. He is made very aware in the presence of God of what can happen with the words that come from our mouths. Now, we may not always realize or understand the full impact of our words till we're standing fully in the presence of God and until Jesus returns and we're made new. But Isaiah gives us a glimpse in this experience of being in the presence of God and being very aware of his broken condition. Our words and our speech, like all aspects of our lives, experience brokenness. But James cautions us here. He cautions us with, with some harsh language and some strong metaphors because he knows that our words are going to be held with extra responsibility and weight and should be held with extra caution because their impact is significant. So James has our attention now. He's going to try to finish this point and take us home, right? He finishes by, by warning us, reminding us that when we're following Jesus, when we're being made new, it matters a great deal what comes from our mouths. He says this, 
The tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. This should not be. What are our mouths designed for, created for? What are they made to do? Well, let's look at the example of God. How, how does he use words? When God made the world, he spoke it into being, right? He used his words to miraculously form the world and give it meaning and purpose. And he brought about unparalleled beauty just by speaking. He didn't start with materials or helpers or other things. He spoke and it was. That's incredible power. With his words, God teaches, he instructs his people. He gives them everything that they need to know. With his words, God expresses love and compassion. With his words, he upholds justice and extends mercy to those in need. With his words, God forgives the sinner and the lost and the broken. And with his words, God rescues and redeems and pulls people back to himself. When I look at all of this and the way God uses his words, it seems to me that these might be some of the things that our words should be used for. Out of the same mouth should not come both praise and cursing, encouragement and hate, love and harm. James says, no, this should not be. And he goes to finish and he says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is James' final attempt here in this section to get his point across to make things as clear as possible for us. His examples may not be as obvious to us as they would be for people back at that time, right? So think of it as like, can an apple tree produce oranges? Can a corn stalk produce blueberries? Absolutely not, right? These things cannot happen. An apple tree was made to produce apples. That's its purpose. To get apples, you have to have an apple tree as the source. And our words have a purpose as well. Our words should be fruitful. James is trying to help us see our words should be fruitful. They should produce fruit, but not just any fruit. The fruit that they were created to produce. Our words should glorify God. They should express love and kindness to others. And in order to have words that are pleasing to God and loving to others, they need to come from the right source. They can't come from any source, and that source is a heart that is united with God's. We can't just produce the right words by sort of clicking our heels or waving a magic wand, right, or just trying harder. That's not how it works. We need to be transformed by the power and the work of God in our lives. Jesus explains this well, going back to Matthew here. He says, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Now he's speaking here to the Pharisees and he's giving them some harsh rebuke. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus is helping us to see this morning. A good tree produces good fruit. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Whatever is stored up inside is what is going to come out in our words. I don't know about you, but this is incredibly convicting to me because I, I know, I know that I've said things that have hurt people. I feel terrible when it happens and, and when I look back and find out later that I would cause someone else harm through my words. But it's also convicting because it seems very clear from the words we're receiving this morning that our words are a reflection of what's going on in our heart. It's not just about how they impact others, but also a reflection of who we are and what's going on inside. This is convicting to me. So what do I do with this? What do I do now? Do I, do I try harder to use kind words? Do I click my heels? 
James is saying, trust Jesus to transform your heart. Jesus and James want us to see so clearly that good words only come from a good source, a transformed heart that is trusting and following after Jesus. Right? James says our words are powerful. They make significant impact, whether positively or negatively. He says our words are central to our spiritual growth. We can use them as a barometer to see where we're at. He also says our words are broken, but that our words can be and should be fruitful. So what do we do with this information? Again, how does it help us to live out our faith in a practical way? Because that's what James is after. He wants to help us grow. He speaks his hard truth and love so that we can become more like Christ and draw closer to God. I want to give you three things this morning as we finish that I think are helpful in our processing of this truth that we've just received. And the first is this. Be honest. Our words are important. Be honest with yourself in the way that you view yourself, talk to yourself. Be honest with God. God already knows everything anyway, but come to him and be honest and say, God, what do I need to hear? Be honest about how you feel to God so that he can help you. And be honest with others. One of the most significant ways we can cause harm and hurt to other people in our lives and to not love them well is to be dishonest with them. Be honest with your words. The next thing is behold. Behold our Father. Behold our Savior. Behold the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can't begin to use our words properly until we fix our eyes on God, until we're looking at him and seeking after him. Then and only then can we be transformed from the inside out in such a way that our words will change and be a reflection of a changed heart. God gives us so many examples of how to use our words. Behold him, follow him, learn from him, and you will see how to use your words. And the last thing is be filled. Be filled. We cannot do this on our own, right? We cannot wave a wand or click our heels. We must be filled with the Spirit. We see this in Acts 2, right? The Spirit came down on Jesus' people, and what happened? They spoke in tongues and brought many people into faith of God and Jesus and seeking after him through the power of the Spirit in them, not because of the eloquence of their words or the education they received, but because the Spirit had come down and indwelt inside of them, and they trusted God and followed the Spirit. Now, we probably aren't going to speak in tongues. We have a hard enough time speaking well in one language. But we should trust in the Spirit and find our power within it. Our words can only be transformative, can only be helpful, can only be God-glorifying and encouraging to our neighbors when the power of the Spirit is working in and through us to do so. The source of our words has to be a heart transformed by Christ or our words will never reflect him and never point others to him. I encourage you to take some time this week to process this, to revisit this passage and allow the words of God to work in your heart and work in your life. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your words. Without them, we would be lost and perpetually broken. God, I'm so thankful that in our brokenness, you walk into our lives, you seek us out, and you pull us towards yourselves, and you make us new. God, help us to trust you. Give us the desire to seek you, to know you, to want our hearts to be transformed so that our words will be those that glorify you and point others to you and build others up. God, we want to be people that know you and honor you and point others to you. Help us to listen to your words and be made new through them. In your name, Jesus, amen. Please stand and worship with us.